Well, hello, and thank you for joining me on Alex on Tech and ITY TV. I'm joined today by Pete Chambers. He is the Managing Director of Sales for Asia Pacific and Japan at AMD. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Alex. Great to be here. Now, AMD's CEO, Lisa Su, made some big announcements at Computex last week in her keynote speech, and anybody can watch that at youtube.com slash AMD. It's the prime video there if you go there right now. But can you please sort of recap some of the highlights for us? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alex. It's a great question. You know, um, it, was a, it was a very strong Computex for us. We had a lot going on and um, some very exciting announcements. So in brief, though, uh, we launched our Ryzen 5000G desktop mm -hmm. APUs. And this is something that the, uh, the ecosystem, our component channel ecosystem has been crying out for. And obviously, it brings our Zen 3 architecture paired with our Radeon graphics into a single um, socket solution. And, you know, it's something that uh, we're very excited about bringing that Zen 3 performance uh, into our component channel. Uh, we also talked about RDNA 2 powered uh, new products. We, we launched some new graphics cards. Uh, we talked about um, having that technology also, our RDNA 2 technology inside Tesla, uh, running inside their Model S and their Model X, which is uh, super exciting. Uh, and we also talked about uh, our partnership with Samsung and how we're planning to work with them with our graphics IP to accelerate uh, what we do on mobile devices. Uh, and of course, we also talked about our new mobile GPUs uh, featuring RDNA 2, which is a very exciting step forward. We're, we're super excited to get back into that mobile high performance space. I think the industry has been crying out for some much needed competition and uh, we're, we're super pleased to be working with our OEM partners to deliver uh, some great new products into that space as well. And then we also talked about uh, Fidelity, Fidelity FX uh, Super Resolution, which is another thing that uh, has been much anticipated and the industry uh, and the ecosystem has been uh, wanting us to talk about that and launch that. And so we, we gave a sneak peek into that and that'll obviously be out in the coming months. Um, and then finally, we talked about um, our 3D stacking, right? And Lisa uh, showcased uh, some new innovative, innovative packaging uh, processes that we have where we're putting uh, additional cache uh, on top of our x86 cores inside uh, our CPUs uh, and that's going to and what they're going to bring and what that means for this for the ecosystem and again AMD just wanting to really innovate and bring uh, new leading edge technology to the marketplace and uh, you know, lead the way yeah well after the 2010s saw a lot of you know stagnation from one of the competitors that everybody knows who I'm talking about it's great to see you know you guys really pushing and uh, winning, you know, getting all those design wins. And I, yeah, I was impressed by seeing the, the graphics, you know, the side-by-side -side comparison. I mean, definitely, if people haven't seen the, the Computex keynote, it's, uh, I think it's only about 40 minutes or something, but it's definitely jam-packed. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah. it's only, I mean, how, I remember back in the early 2000s when the you know, first Xboxes and, and PS3s came out, and back then they were talking about how the graphics are an inch away from reality. But we've come a long way since then. But I'm, I'm just imagining in, in the future... That uh, you know they'll resurrect all the uh, famous movie stars. You'll have a young Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, with Jimmy Stewart and Marilyn Monroe, you know, acting with Vin Diesel and and maybe a de-aged, um, you know, I don't know, Bruce Willis in a movie that people want to watch. <laughs> de-aged me would be great as well. That'd be fantastic. That's right. Well, that'll be a lot of grey, and they, they could take the grey out of my beard. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, that'll probably be the next feature on Zoom, right? You know, or FaceTime. Or yeah, yeah that, that probably is actually. <laughs> the de-aged. Well, I've got the, the all beauty those, filter. I've got all those beauty modes, but yeah, they, they're they're a little bit. They're a bit sort of uncanny valley for me. But anyway, I'm sure over the next few years, we're going to see some incredible advancements in the area of graphics. And that is one of AMD's strengths. But look, you mentioned the new Ryzen processors. They're there for consumers, they're there for businesses, and, and obviously for gamers, with gaming still a huge market. I mean, AMD owns the gaming space with, uh, you know, making the processors for PS, Playstations and Xboxes. But of course, it's on the PCs sure. that if you want to go beyond what your, uh, you know, what'll be a five-year PlayStation 5 in five years, you know, with, uh, obviously, they will be eking out every ounce of, of uh, in, you know, power out of those devices, but the, the latest and greatest is always in the, the PC era. But you've got also, as you mentioned, the Epic processors for servers, and you also have your AMD high-performance computing ecosystem. So what is your message for the data center operators who are, you know, enjoying incredible times as everything is online, everything is in the cloud, everything has to be backed up. We saw that fastly, um, you know, yeah. outage where half the world's big websites went down. So, you know, what is your message to all those guys about the latest gen Epic processor? 
Yeah, look, great, great points there. And obviously, you touched on our gaming console business, and we're super proud of that. You know, and obviously, it's the it, it's a, it's the first time that both those brands have gone back to back in choosing uh, a, a particular vendor to provide them with their silicon. So, we're super proud of what we've done there. But uh, obviously, data center is a big focus for us. Um, and it's certainly been an area over the last four years we've put a lot of focus in as we brought Epic to market back in 2017. Uh, and to your point, you know, more than ever at the moment, there's massive amounts of demand, you know, driven by obviously uh, the demand for virtual uh, working virtually for exactly what we're doing now. Um, you know, virtual conference calls, whether it's Teams, Zoom, you know, all those sort of applications are all being run on the cloud. So um, Epic is in a fantastic position to help you know, enable those those solutions. And of course, you touched on also our HPC um, support as well. And, and that's another area where we can help researchers really solve, you know, the problems of the world and, 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 and solve some of those uh, very uh, intensive, um, you know, research things as well. Um, and then when we look at Epic, you know, I'm not sure if you know this, we actually have over 200 world records uh, for Epic uh, across many applications, whether it be um, the cloud enterprise or HPC, um, we've got a very, very strong offering in that place. And so there's something we can, you know, we have a very strong offering, uh, whether that be around integer, floating point, Java virtualization, database and analytics. Um, we have, you know, the offering that can really help our customers uh, manage their data center needs and their cloud needs as well. So, you know, talking about high performance computing, right in Australia's own backyard, we have the Porsche yes. supercomputer using Epic CPUs. So can you please tell us more about that supercomputer and what it's being used for? Yeah, sure. And look, you know, our partnership with Pause and HPC is something that we're immensely proud of. Um, and it's an infrastructure uh, project where we're providing both the CPU and the GPU. So we're using our Epic um, CPUs and it's also being paired with our, um, our AMD Instinct uh, accelerators as well. So that particular installation has over 200,000 CPU cores, which is just phenomenal. It's over pen, 50 uh, petaflops of raw compute power. Um, so it's, and it's, 30, it's a 30 fold increase over the, the, the previous installation. So really delivering a massive step up. So you asked about what are the things that they're looking to do with it? So, mm. you know, it's all about Australian researchers uh, and, you know, in the fields of medicine, artificial intelligence, uh, radio astronomy, uh, and many, many more things. But uh, yeah, we're super excited about that partnership with Pawsey and HPE. Absolutely. And I'm assuming they would have tried to run Crisis on it? That's mandatory, isn't it? That's the first question when you benchmark, you know, can it run Crisis? <laughs> I'm fairly right. confident it can run Crisis. We could probably run, we do a very good job of that. You could probably run a thousand virtual sessions of Crisis in perfect fidelity, you know, because it's got so much power and, and still have plenty of power to spare. But <laughs> so, you know, obviously it was a, it was a big win for AMD to have poor CUs. Yes you know, the Epic processes, but what other activity are you seeing globally in the supercomputing space and in the region? I mean, we hear about supercomputing records in China and Japan and America, and there's obviously a race there, but uh, what else is happening with supercomputers that you can talk about? Yeah, well, it, it is a lot going on, and it's certainly an area of focus for our business um, where, you know, we, we feel that Epic brings some, you know, very unique um, value proposition into that spe that specific space, rather. Mm. Um, more recently, um, the National Supercomputing Centre in Singapore uh, chose Epic. Uh, that's a recent win, uh, and we're super pleased to be partnering there as well. Um, and then, of course, Pawsey, we talked about, you know, with it, you know, and then also um, we've had a number of other wins around the world as well. Um, in the US with El Capitan and a number of other um, large supercomputer installations. So, you know, a lot of momentum in that space. We see a lot more opportunity. You know, not, I can't talk about a lot of it, but no. um, certainly an area that we're, we're very much focused on and where we feel that we can really add value to our, our customers. Sure. Now, I'm not sure if you already mentioned some of, some of these things, but, you know, obviously we know that uh, with servers and high com performance computing being so big, your competitors are also working hard in that particular space. But what does AMD say are the key benefits in specifying third-gen EPIC over competing solutions? Sure, great question. Look, you know, for, for me, there's a, there's a number of things. So first of all, I think it's very important. You know, we, we're able to deliver up to 64 cores, and I know this is a tech spec and it's a speed and feed, but mm. there's a tangible benefit to be able to create that core density. Um, and so um, being able to fit more CPU cores in a single rack unit obviously mm -hmm. has benefits. Um, it's a very power efficient product. Um, and then also because you can fit more into a smaller space, you have less power uh, requirements and also you have less cooling requirements. So that ultimately drives a, a great TCO. And then if you think about workloads, um, there's certain um, 
software applications that are licensed per socket. Mm. So, um, you know, if you can fit more cores into an individual socket, obviously there's a tangible saving there as well. So um, fantastic performance, um, fantastic power efficiency, and, you know, you know, leadership core density, I think, are probably the, the key things that uh, are really the, the core of the value proposition that, uh, that those Epic products are bringing. Well, no doubt a lot of those data centers who are on the upgrade cycle would be contacting you to find out how they can, you know, upgrade. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Now, one of the big buzzwords of the last decade has been digital transformation. And, you know, yes. I, I would say that some companies have gone through that multiple times because they may have started it in the 2000s or the early 2010s and then platforms change, you know, cloud technologies change, processes and graphics change. I mean, protocols change, things change, broadband changes and all the rest. So, mm. um, you know, we've seen a big jump in PC sales over the past year and a half as digital transformation was accelerated to light speed due to the need to work from home and all of the other, uh, you know, things surrounding the pandemic. So how is AMD telling its customers that it is contributing to this continuing wave, the continuing, uh, you know, transformation that is digital transformation? Yeah, great question. And again, I think the pandemic has absolutely accelerated business transformation, not just in Australia, but globally, oh, right? Absolutely. And I think high performance computing in our daily lives and, and, and our home and work has never been greater, right? I mean, we're spending a lot more time on our PCs. I know working from home, um, when I used to, I used to travel, I used to travel every week. And mm -hmm. so now you're at home, you roll out of bed, you're on your PC. So I think everyone is spending a lot more time. Um, and that means that folks are upgrading. We're seeing a big trend in the marketplace to higher ASP. So people are wanting better quality screens. They're wanting better quality um, cameras on their notebooks. Um, they expect a higher level of performance. And that's borne out in the trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. Um, and so, you know, from our perspective, we're working very closely with our partners to deliver that, you know, exceptional experience when it comes to mobile. Um, and then also, we want to work. We want to work from anywhere, right? I know it's a cliche. We've talked about it a lot. Yeah, um, sure. But the reality of it is, there's days I don't want to sit at my computer uh, on, on a camera all day if I can avoid it. And there's days I'll take my laptop and go and sit outside. Um, you know, get a bit of sun and move around. And I know in, in other areas um, where you're not in lockdown, obviously you can go and sit in a coffee shop and those sort of things. So mm. that customer is not just looking for, um, you know, a, a premium device. They're looking for something that gives them a great experience. That's longer battery life, um, better performance for multitasking. And then of course, they're looking for those other tangible benefits like the weight of the product, um, the camera quality, as I mentioned, and of course, the screen and the brightness of the screen and how that works in daylight and those sort of things. So we work very closely with our ecosystem partners to really you know, provide a great experience in that regard. And then of course, from an enterprise standpoint, as we touched on before, um, you know, delivering that great infrastructure to make sure that um, you know, the, uh, the, the customers can collect, access and store data seamlessly and securely. Uh, that's incredibly important for business as they scale up to meet the demands of their customer base and their um, their sales force, frankly. Yeah. Well, the proof's in the pudding with uh, increasing design wins for AMD. You see more AMD powered yeah. machines for sale at for sale at the retail stores and, and in the business space. So you know, if the if the partners weren't on board, you wouldn't see that, and they're on board, and it, it's great for competition. And that whole thin and light revolution that started, you know, more than a decade ago. I mean, it's never stopped, and now we want bigger screens and that you know, twenty hours of battery life. That's sort of more than double. I mean, I remember when PCs had you know, three or four hours and those days are long gone. So thank God. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, everyone has higher expectations. Everybody, and that's the thing, right? And that's why we need to, we continue to innovate. Uh, the expectation is they want more performance, right? Everybody wants more performance, but they want it at, you know, ultimately longer battery life, which means it needs to be more efficient. So, you know, we've got to continue to, to focus on that. And that's certainly an area where we continue to put our engineering efforts to deliver that great experience and to move the technology forward at a great pace. So were, were there any lessons that AMD itself learned from the pandemic that uh, uh, you can share and that you've helped your own customers to overcome and deal with? Yeah, I mean, there's sort of three things, at least from, from my perspective, that sort of come to mind. Um, uh, you know, the past year and a half, you know, obviously since the outbreak has been a challenging time for all of us. Mm. Uh, the first thing for us has obviously been the health and well-being of our internal and external, you know, employees. Uh, and ensuring that that they're you know they're keeping safe uh, and you know adapting to the environment. So that's meant 
you know, we've done a lot of work internally to support them in, you know, setting up home offices and making sure they've got the tools to work safely from, you know, their home environment. Uh, I think that's been very, very key and making sure they don't feel the need they have to go out, you know, uh, when, you know, obviously there's, there's certain things happening in the environment. Mm. I think the other thing for me has been, you know, adapting to, um, just making sure that we maintain our relationships with our partners, right? Um, if I think about myself, I used to travel every week. I mm. traveled around 130 nights a year. Uh, and so did our sales team, right? Mm. Our job is to be in front of our customers and to provide them support and work with our partners. Um, and traditionally, we did that by being in front of them. And mm. obviously, the obviously what's happened over the last 18 months has meant that we've had to adapt and change. Um, and it's more critical than ever to make sure that our customers and our partners feel connected uh, and feel that we're there still working with them. Obviously, uh, the pandemic has driven you know, a high level of demand for, for IT products. And we see you know, that we, we're key in that, um, that evolution to help support that transition. And we, uh, we, we value that uh, opportunity very, very highly. And so making sure that we've continued to stay connected to our partners and our customers has been key. And then fi finally, for me, the other big change has been the hiring process. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, we would go and interview, final interviews would always be in person. We would fly people into a centralized location to do onboarding and do training, um, all that sort of thing. And of course, that hasn't been able to happen. And yeah. so uh, we've had to adapt very, very quickly from a traditional environment to a virtual environment. Um, so, you know, we've hired all the way through the last 18 months and we've had to do that because the business has been growing at, at, at a significant rate um, across all our verticals. Mm. And, and so it's very important to me to make sure that we have the sales team in place to support that growth and support our customers. Uh, and to do that, we needed, we needed to keep hiring. And so, you know, adapting to that environment where we're interviewing um, virtually, onboarding virtually, training virtually uh, has been something that um, has been a very um is a, is a new experience frankly because again traditionally we've done a lot of it in person uh but you know using those tools like teams and and such is um has been key to how we've kept the business maintained over the last 18 months yeah well look to switch gears a little as we get towards the end of the interview i always like to ask the people i'm interviewing what their memory of their first computer was and then uh, depending oh on goodness. how old you are you know what was your memory of the first time you went online but let's start with the computer first well, this is probably going to give away my age, Alex. Um, my first PC was an Osborne uh, computer. Okay, yeah. Uh, it had a, it had a turbo <laughs> button. Yep. Right. So I you, have one only of a certain yeah. only a certain number of folks are going to remember the turbo button yeah uh, it was insanely expensive i think my parents uh, credit to my parents i think it was over four thousand yeah. dollars back in the day and it was paid off over a long period of time um but certainly a yeah, five and a quarter inch floppy we had a, a nine pin dot matrix uh printer that came tractor feed uh, yeah. printer that came through it came with it so yeah that, that and everything was you know obviously dos prompts and, and so on and so forth so yeah that that was my first experience with a pc in the home mm. i would say and then uh to your second question, I think you're asking about the first time I went online. Yeah, was it a bulletin um, board or was it the internet? Because, I mean, a lot of people about, I, who use the internet don't know that bulletin boards existed before then. The old BBS. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not entirely sure. It certainly was dial-up because every time someone dialed the house, it would disconnect the modem, which was very frustrating. So you tended to wait until quite late at night before you went online. Mm. Um, but it was probably to, you know, legally download music, I would say. Um, it was probably... Um, what I used it for predominantly in my uh, my early twenties. Well, that's why MP3s were invented because they needed to uh, figure out a way to get movies, uh, movies to get music into a format that you could send over a phone line because we just certainly didn't have broadband. Yeah. And you know, that, that you could have wave. I mean, a CD was seven hundred megabytes. Try sending that over right. a phone line uh, over the dial up, it would have taken a week, you know, or longer. So. Yes. Well, you know, it's always fascinating to hear because for different age groups, it's different computers. You know, some for some people, it's the Amigas or Commodore 64s. But yeah, for most people, it was the old DOS days. And uh, yeah, I remember those days fondly. But I, I knew that one day in the future, we'd have color screens and 3D. And of course, kids yeah. don't know a world that's any different these days, you know. So it's just amazing how it's all changed. And look, so... It's come a long way in a very short period of time. That's right. Well, that's right. I mean, only 20 or so years, 20, 30 years and bang. Yeah. So uh, what is a little bit about your own history in the world of tech? Well, I, I, um, I started my journey actually as a two-way radio technician, okay. um, working on, you know, uh, cement trucks and taxis and things like that, working on their two-way radios. And that was around the time of the very first generation of uh, mobile phones, you know, that were in cars. Yeah. 
Uh, so I did that for a few years. Then I worked at Dick Smith. Worked in sales. I worked at Dick Smith. Funnily enough. For a, for a while. Yes, too. worked at Dick Smith uh, in Parramatta in yeah. Sydney in the George Street store uh, for a couple of years. Um, and that was that was super enjoyable because uh, that was again back in the day of you know obviously PCs were becoming a lot more prevalent then, mm. uh, and we used to stay back on a Friday night and we'd have our own LAN party yeah. playing Doom. Yeah, um, back I in the day, doing that, that one of my first jobs. You'd hardwire, you'd Ethernet the, the things together, and um, you know do do local LAN parties, mm. um, which was which was always fun. Um, and then yeah, moved out of moved out of that into working for Lexmark and Fuji Xerox. So I did oh gee, 11, 12 years in print. Um, and then most recently, you know, coming up over 10 years now in, with AMD in the IT industry, in, in, in the CPU business. So, yeah, over, over 20 years, I would say. Well, it's a, it's a testimony to the sort of broad-ranging history of the world of technology that we spoke about from the early days when you, you know, you're using dot matrix printers. And I'm sure when you first printed those little things out on a dot matrix printer and heard all those little noises that you didn't think that one day you'd be work, spending a decade of your life working for print companies, but... No, are. that's right. Yeah. So yep. uh, from the past sort of to the present and the future, I mean, you mentioned, we, we talked a little bit, I guess, about trends, and but is there anything else about current trends you want to mention which could lead into, you know, everything? I mean, the current trends of today is what everyone will be using tomorrow. So any thoughts on that? Mm. Um, no, as I think, I think, I think, you know, Innovation is key. Uh, it will march on consistently, and I think that's absolutely where AMD is focused, right? Um, you, you need to be at the cutting edge to be uh, meaningful in this marketplace, mm. uh, and we'll continue. I think the one thing that, uh, that Lisa said and Mark Papermaster, our CTO, has said consistently is that you know we will continue to innovate. Uh, we want to be market leaders, and uh, it's a simple, a simple but straightforward plan, right? Um, innovate. And so, you know, whether that's, you know, in the data center, in the mobile devices, from a, a graphic standpoint, we, we want to bring leadership technology to the market and, uh, you know, drive it forward. And I think we've seen some of that as we touched on earlier with CES. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, the next the next wave of how we bring that more performance and more efficiency um, to the marketplace, to the customer. And uh, my second last question is simply to ask, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received in life to help you get where you are today? Oh, I've had lots of advice over the years. Um, look, I, I think the simplest one is just treat people how you want to be treated. Mm. Um, you know, be humble, treat people with respect, always be learning, and listen more than you talk. Uh, it'd be probably how I'd sum that up. Yeah, well, they always say, you know, two ears and one mouth. <laughs> Sometimes I forget. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's true. And, you know, I, even I say to my kids now, I've got, I've got three young boys. And it's like if you get anything in life, just, you know, great manners. Always be polite. You know, manners can get you a long way in life as well. So, yeah, but yeah, treat people how you want to be treated, I think, is um, a great a great uh, adage to live by. Now, you probably answered this last question partially in the previous one. But, you know, what is your final message to ITY viewers and readers and to your current and future customers and partners? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, as I said before, I think you know, expect more great things from AMD. We're on a journey, um, and it's important we set our own path. And I think a lot of people, you know, when you look back at chiplets, when we first came out with chiplets, uh, there was a, there was some detractors in the marketplace, and people said that they were glued together and all this sort of thing. And I think, you know, we've we've seen that proven to be, um, you know, um, not a wise uh, thought process, Absolutely, right? I mean, yeah. the, the product today is really driven a great deal of momentum in the marketplace. Um, it's scalable. It gives customers a great amount of choice in a single socket. Um, and, you know, as I said before, we just want to continue to innovate, bring great products to market um, and, you know, really drive the industry forward. Well, Pete Chambers, Managing Director of Sales at Asia Pacific Japan for AMD, thank you very much for your time. Good luck with all of the advancements and innovations of the future. And I hope we get to speak again. Absolutely great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alex. Thank Cheers. You. Bye-bye.